Section 14. Editor in Continuation. Events seemed molded expressly to produce the state of feeling which marked that disastrous day, the 20th of June, 1792. It frequently happens that nations, like individuals, rush wildly upon the very dangers they apprehend, and select such courses as invite what they are most solicitous to avoid. So it was with everything preceding this dreadful day. By a series of singular occurrences I did not witness its horrors, though in some degree their victim. Not to detain my readers unnecessarily, I will proceed directly to the accident which withdrew me from the scene. The apartment of the Princess de Lambal, in the pavilion of Flora, looked from one side upon the Pont Royal. On the day of which I speak, a considerable quantity of combustibles had been thrown from the bridge into one of her rooms. The princess, in great alarm, sent instantly for me. She desired to have my English man servant, if he were not afraid, secreted in her room, while she herself withdrew to another part of the palace, till the extent of the intended mischief could be ascertained. I assured Her Highness that I was not only ready to answer for my servant, but would myself remain with him, as he always went armed, and I was so certain of his courage and fidelity that I could not hesitate even to trust my life in his hands. For God's sake, Mia Cara, exclaimed the princess, do not risk your own safety, if you have any value for my friendship. I desire you not to go near the pavilion of Flora. Your servant's going is quite sufficient. Never again let me hear such a proposition. What? After having hitherto conducted yourself so punctually, would you, by one rash act, devote yourself to ruin and deprive us of your valuable services? I begged Her Highness would pardon the ardor of the dutiful zeal I felt for her in the moment of danger. Yes, yes, continued she, that is all very well, but this is not the first time I have been alarmed at your too great intrepidity. And if ever I hear of your again attempting to commit yourself so wantonly, I will have you sent to Turin immediately, there to remain till you have recovered your senses. I always thought English heads cool. But I suppose your residence in France has changed the national character of yours. Once more, with tears in my eyes, I begged her forgiveness, and, on my knees, implored that she would not send me away in the hour of danger. After having so long enjoyed the honor of her confidence, I trusted she would overlook my fault, particularly as it was the pure emanation of my resentment at any conspiracy against one I so dearly loved. And to whom I had been under so many obligations, that the very idea of being deprived of such a benefactress drove me frantic. Her Highness burst into tears. I know your heart, exclaimed she. But I also know too well our situation, and it is that which makes me tremble for the consequences which must follow your overstepping the bounds so necessary to be observed by all of us at this horrid period. And then she called me again her cars Inglesina, and graciously condescended to embrace me, and bathed my face with her tears, in token of her forgiveness, and bade me sit down and compose myself, and weep no more. Scarcely was I seated, when we were both startled by deafening shouts for the head of Madame Vito, the name they gave the poor unfortunate queen. An immense crowd of cannibals and hired ruffians were already in the tilleries, brandishing all sorts of murderous weapons, and howling for blood. My recollections from this moment are very indistinct. I know that in an instant the apartment was filled, that the Queen, the Princess Elizabeth, all the attendants, even the King, I believe, appeared there. I myself received a wound upon my hand in warding a blow from my face. And in the turmoil of the scene, and of the blow, I fainted, and was conveyed by some humane person to a place of safety, in the upper part of the palace. Thus deprived of my senses for several hours, I was spared the agony of witnessing the scenes of horror that succeeded. For two or three days I remained in a state of so much exhaustion and alarm, that when the princess came to me I did not know her, nor even where I was. As soon as I was sufficiently recovered, places were taken for me and another person in one of the common diligences, by which I was conveyed to Passy, where the princess came to me in the greatest confusion. My companion in the palace was the widow of one of the Swiss guards, who had been murdered on the 6th of October, in defending the Queen's apartment at Versailles. The poor woman had been herself protected by Her Majesty, and accompanied me by the express order of the Princess de Lambal. 
What the princess said to her on departing, I know not, for I only caught the words, general insurrection, on hearing which the afflicted woman fell into a fit. To me, her highness merely exclaimed, Do not come to Paris till you hear from me. And immediately set off to return to the Tilleries. However, as usual, my courage soon got the better of my strength, and of every consideration of personal safety. On the third day, I proposed to the person who took care of me that we should both walk out together, and, if there appeared no symptoms of immediate danger, it was agreed that we might as well get into one of the common conveyances. And proceed forthwith to Paris. For I could no longer repress my anxiety to learn what was going on there, and the good creature who was with me was no less impatient. When we got into a diligence, I felt the dread of another severe lecture like the last, and thought it best not to incur fresh blame by new imprudence. I therefore told the driver to set us down on the high road near Paris leading to the Bois de Boulogne. But before we got so far, the woods resounded with the howling of mobs, and we heard, Vive le Roy, vociferated, mingled with, Down with the King, Down with the Queen. And, what was still more horrible, the two parties were in actual bloody strife, and the ground was strewn with the bodies of dead men, lying like slaughtered sheep. It was fortunate that we were the only persons in the vehicle. The driver, observing our extreme agitation, turned round to us. Nay, nay, cried he, do not alarm yourselves. It is only the constitutionalists and the Jacobins fighting against each other. I wish the devil had them both. It was evident, however, that, though the man was desirous of quieting our apprehensions, he was considerably disturbed by his own. For though he acknowledged he had a wife and children in Paris, who he hoped were safe, still he dared not venture to proceed, but said, if we wished to be driven back, he would take us to any place we liked, out of Paris. Our anxiety to know what was going forward at the Tilleries was now become intolerable, and the more so, from the necessity we felt of restraining our feelings. At last, however, we were in some degree relieved from this agony of reserve. God knows, exclaimed the driver, what will be the consequence of all this bloodshed. The poor king and queen are greatly to be pitied. This ejaculation restored our courage, and we said he might drive us wherever he chose out of the sight of those horrors, and it was at length settled that he should take us to Passy. Oh, cried he, if you will allow me, I will take you to my father's house there, for you seem more dead than alive, both of you, and ought to go where you can rest in quiet and safety. My companion, who was a German, now addressed me in that language. German, exclaimed the driver on hearing her. German. Why, I am a German myself, and serve the good king, who is much to be pitied, for many years. And when I was wounded, the queen, God bless her, set me up in the world, as I was made an invalid, and I have ever since been enabled to support my family respectably. D. The Assembly. I shall never be a farthing the better for them. Oh, replied I, then I suppose you are not a Jacobin. The driver, with a torrent of curses, then began execrating the very name of Jacobin. This emboldened me to ask him when he had left Paris. He replied, only this very morning, and added that the assembly had shut the gates of the Tilleries under the pretense of preventing the king and queen from being assassinated. But that is all a confounded lie, continued he, invented to keep out the friends of the royal family. But, God knows, they are now so fallen, they have few such left to be turned away. I am more enraged, pursued he, at the ingratitude of the nobility than I am at these hordes of bloodthirsty plunderers, for we all know that the nobility owe everything to the king. Why do they not rise en masse to shield the royal family from these bloodhounds? Can they imagine they will be spared if the king should be murdered? I have no patience with them. I then asked him our fare. Two livres is the fare, but you shall not pay anything. I see plainly, ladies, that you are not what you assume to be. My good man, replied I, we are not, and therefore take this Louis d'Or for your trouble. He caught my hand and pressed it to his lips, exclaiming, I never in my life knew a man who was faithful to his king, that God did not provide for. He then took us to Passy, but advised us not to remain at the place where we had been staying. 
and fortunate enough it was for us that we did not, for the house was set on fire and plundered by a rebel mob very soon after. I told the driver how much I was obliged to him for his services, and he seemed delighted when I promised to give him proofs of my confidence in his fidelity. If, said I, you can find out my servant whom I left in Paris, I will give you another Louis d'Or. I was afraid, at first, to mention where he was to look for him. If he be not dead, replied the driver, I will find him out. What? cried I, even though he should be at the Tilleries. Why, madam, I am one of the National Guard. I have only to put on my uniform to be enabled to go to any part of the palace I please. Tell me his name, and where you think it likely he may be found, and depend upon it I will bring him to you. Perhaps, continued he, it is your husband disguised as a servant, but no matter. Give me a clue, and I'll warrant you he shall tell you the rest himself by this time tomorrow. Well, then, replied I, he is in the pavilion of Flora. What, with the Princess de Lambeau? Oh, I would go through fire and water for that good princess. She has done me the honor to stand godmother to one of my children, and allows her a pension. I took him at his word. We changed our quarters to his father's house, a very neat little cottage, about a quarter of a mile from the town. He afterwards rendered me many services in going to and fro from Passy to Paris, and, as he promised, brought me my servant. When the poor fellow arrived, his arm was in a sling. He had been wounded by a musket shot, received in defense of the princess. The history of his disaster was this. On the night of the riot, as he was going from the Pont Royal to the apartment of Her Highness, he detected a group of villains under her windows. Six of them were attempting to enter by a ladder. He fired, and two fell. While he was reloading, the others shot at him. Had he not, in the flurry of the moment, fired both his pistols at the same time, he thinks he should not have been wounded, but might have punished the assailant. One of the men, he said, could have been easily taken by the National Guard, who so glaringly encouraged the escape that he could almost swear the guard was a party concerned. The loss of blood had so exhausted him that he could not pursue the offender himself, whom otherwise he could have taken without any difficulty. As the employing of my servant had only been proposed, and the sudden interruption of my conversation with Her Highness by the riot had prevented my ever communicating the project to him, I wondered how he got into the business. Or ascertained so soon that the apartment of the princess was in danger. He explained that he never had heard of its being so. But my own coachman having left me at the palace that day, and not hearing of me for some time, had driven home, and, fearing that my not returning arose from something which had happened, advised him to go to the Pont Royal and hear what he could learn, as there was a report of many persons having been murdered and thrown over the bridge. My man took the advice, and armed himself to be ready in case of attack. It was between one and two o'clock after midnight when he went. The first objects he perceived were these miscreants attempting to scale the palace. He told me that the queen had been most grossly insulted, that the gates of the Tilleries had been shut in consequence. That a small part alone remained open to the public, who were kept at their distance by a national ribbon, which none could pass without being instantly arrested. This had prevented his apprising the princess of the attempt which he had accidentally defeated, and which he wished me to communicate to her immediately. I did so by letter, which my good driver carried to Paris, and delivered safe into the hands of our benefactress. The surprise of the princess on hearing from me, and her pleasure at my good fortune in finding by accident such means, baffles all description. Though she was at the time overwhelmed with the imminent dangers which threatened her, yet she still found leisure to show her kindness to those who were doing their best, though in vain, to serve her. The following letter, which she sent me in reply, written amidst all the uneasiness it describes, will speak for her more eloquently than my praises. I can understand your anxiety. It was well for you that you were unconscious of the dreadful scenes which were passing around you on that horrid day. The Princess de Tarente, Madame de Tourzel, Madame de Maca, and all the other ladies of the household owed the safety of their lives to one of the National Guards having given his national cockade to the Queen. Her Majesty placed it on her head, unperceived by the mob. 
one of the gentlemen of the king's wardrobe provided the king and the princess Elizabeth with the same impenetrable shield. Though the cannibals came for murder, I could not but admire the enthusiastic deference that was shown to this symbol of authority, which instantly paralyzed, the daggers uplifted for our extermination. Merlin de Thionville was the stoic head of this party. The Princess Elizabeth having pointed him out to me, I ventured to address him respecting the dangerous situation to which the royal family were daily exposed. I flattered him upon his influence over the majority of the faubourgs, to which only we could look for the extinction of these disorders. He replied that the despotism of the court had set a bad example to the people. That he felt for the situation of the royal party as individuals, but he felt much more for the safety of the French nation, who were in still greater danger than their majesties had to dread, from the Austrian faction. By which a foreign army had been encouraged to invade the territory of France, where they were now waiting the opportunity of annihilating French liberty forever. To this Her Majesty replied, when the deputies of the assembly have permitted, nay, I may say, encouraged this open violation of the king's asylum, and, by their indifference to the safety of all those who surround us, have sanctioned the daily insults to which we have been, and still are, exposed, it is not to be wondered, at that all sovereigns should consider it their interest to make common cause with us, to crush internal commotions, leveled. Not only against the throne, and the persons of the sovereign and his family, but against the very principle of monarchy itself. Here the king, though much intimidated for the situation of the queen and his family, for whose heads the wretches were at that very moment howling in their ears, took up the conversation. These cruel facts, said he, and the menacing situation you even now witness, fully justify our not rejecting foreign aid, though God knows how deeply I deplore the necessity of such a cruel resource. But, when all internal measures of conciliation have been trodden underfoot, and the authorities, who ought to check it and protect us from these cruel outrages, are only occupied in daily fomenting the discord between us and our subjects. Though a forlorn hope, what other hope is there of safety? I foresee the drift of all these commotions, and am resigned, but what will become of this misguided nation, when the head of it shall be destroyed? Here the king, nearly choked by his feelings, was compelled to pause for a moment, and he then proceeded. I should not feel it any sacrifice to give up the guardianship of the nation, could I, in so doing, ensure its future tranquillity. But I foresee that my blood, like that of one of my unhappy brother sovereigns, Charles I, of England, will only open the floodgates of human misery, the torrent of which, swelled with the best blood of France, will deluge this once peaceful realm. This, as well as I can recollect, is the substance of what passed at the castle on this momentous day. Our situation was extremely doubtful, and the noise and horrid riots were at times so boisterous, that frequently we could not, though so near them, distinguish a word the king and queen said. And yet, whenever the leaders of these organized ruffians spoke or threatened, the most respectful stillness instantly prevailed. I weep in silence for misfortunes, which I fear are inevitable. The king, the queen, the princess Elizabeth and myself, with many others under this unhappy roof, have never ventured to undress or sleep in bed, till last night. None of us any longer reside on the ground floor. By the very manly exertions of some of the old officers incorporated in the national army, the awful riot I have described was overpowered, and the mob, with difficulty, dispersed. Among these, I should particularize generals de Vominal, de Mandat, and de Roderer. Principally by their means the interior of the Tilleries was at last cleared, though partial mobs, such as you have often witnessed, still subsist. I am thus particular in giving you a full account of this last revolutionary commotion, that your prudence may still keep you at a distance from the vortex. Continue where you are, and tell your man-servant how much I am obliged to him, and, at the same time, how much I am grieved at his being wounded. I knew nothing of the affair but from your letter and your faithful messenger. He is an old pensioner of mine, and a good honest fellow. You may depend on him. Serve yourself, through him, in communicating with me. Though he has had a limited education, he is not wanting in intellect. Remember that honesty, in matters of such vital import, is to be trusted before genius. My apartment appears like a barrack, 
like a bare garden, like anything but what it was. Numbers of valuable things have been destroyed, numbers carried off. Still, notwithstanding all the horrors of these last days, it delights me to be able to tell you that no one in the service of the royal family failed in duty at this dreadful crisis. I think we may firmly rely on the inviolable attachment of all around us. No jealousy, no considerations of etiquette, stood in the way of their exertions to show themselves worthy of the situations they hold. The Queen showed the greatest intrepidity during the whole of these trying scenes. At present, I can say no more. Petion, the mayor of Paris, has just been announced. And, I believe, he wishes for an audience of Her Majesty, though he never made his appearance during the whole time of the riots in the palace. Adieu, mia cara Inglesina. The receipt of this letter, however it might have affected me to hear what Her Highness suffered, in common with the rest of the unfortunate royal inmates of the Tilleries. Gave me extreme pleasure from the assurance it contained of the firmness of those nearest to the sufferers. I was also sincerely gratified in reflecting on the probity and disinterested fidelity of this worthy man, which contrasted him, so strikingly and so advantageously to himself, with many persons of birth and education. Whose attachment could not stand the test of the trying scenes of the revolution, which made them abandon and betray, where they had sworn an allegiance to which they were doubly bound by gratitude. My man's servant was attended, and taken the greatest care of. The princess never missed a day in sending to inquire after his health. And, on his recovery, the queen herself not only graciously condescended to see him, but, besides making him a valuable present, said many flattering and obliging things of his bravery and disinterestedness. I should scarcely have deemed these particulars honourable as they are to the feelings of the illustrious personages from whom they proceeded, worth mentioning in a work of this kind. Did they not give indications of character rarely to be met with, and, in their case, how shamefully rewarded? From having occurred at a crisis when their minds were occupied in affairs of such deep importance, and amidst the appalling dangers which hourly threatened their own existence. Her Majesty's correspondence with foreign courts had been so much increased by these scenes of horror, especially her correspondence with her relations in Italy, that, ere long, I was sent for back to Paris. Section 15 Journal of the Princess resumed and concluded. The insurrection of the 20th of June, and the uncertain state of the safety of the royal family, menaced as it was by almost daily riots induced a number of well-disposed persons to prevail on General Lafayette to leave his army and come to Paris, and there personally remonstrate against these outrages. Had he been sincere he would have backed the measure by appearing at the head of his army, then well-disposed, as Cromwell did when he turned out the rogues who were seeking the Lord through the blood of their king, and put the keys in his pocket. Violent disorders require violent remedies. With an army in a few pieces of cannon at the door of the assembly, whose members were seeking the aid of the devil, for the accomplishment of their horrors, he might, as was done when the same scene occurred in England in 1668, by good management, have averted the deluge of blood. But, by appearing before the assembly isolated, without a voila mondroit, which the king of Prussia had had engraven on his cannon, he lost the opinion of all parties. 43. Lafayette came to the palace frequently, but the king would never see him. He was obliged to return, with the additional mortification of having been deceived in his expected support from the National Guard of Paris, whose pay had been secretly trebled by the National Assembly, in order to secure them to itself. His own safety, therefore, required that he should join the troops under his command. He left many persons in whom he thought he could confide among whom were some who came to me one day requesting I would present them to the queen without loss of time, as a man condemned to be shot had confessed to his captain that there was a plot laid to murder her majesty that very night. I hastened to the royal apartment, without mentioning the motive. But some such catastrophe was no more than what we incessantly expected, from the almost hourly changes of the National Guard, for the real purpose of giving easy access to all sorts of wretches to the very rooms of the unfortunate queen in order to furnish opportunities for committing the crime with impunity. After I had seen the Queen, the applicants were introduced, and, in my presence, a paper was handed by them to Her Majesty. 
At the moment she received it, I was obliged to leave her for the purpose of watching an opportunity for their departure unobserved. These precautions were necessary with regard to every person who came to us in the palace, otherwise the jealousy of the assembly and its emissaries and the National Guard of the Interior might have been alarmed. And we should have been placed under express and open surveillance. The confusion created by the constant change of guard, however, stood us in good stead in this emergency. Much passing and repassing took place unheeded in the bustle. When the visitors had departed, and Her Majesty at one window of the palace, and I at another, had seen them safe over the Pont Royal, I returned to Her Majesty. She then graciously handed me the paper which they had presented. It contained an earnest supplication, signed by many thousand good citizens, that the King and Queen would sanction the plan of sending the Dauphin to the army of Lafayette. They pledged themselves, with the assistance of the royalists, to rescue the royal family. They, urged that if once the king could be persuaded to show himself at the head of his army, without taking any active part, but merely for his own safety and that of his family, everything might be accomplished with the greatest tranquility. The queen exclaimed, What? Send my child? No. Never while I breathe. 44. Yet were I an independent queen, or the regent of a minority, I feel that I should be inclined to accept the offer, to place myself at the head of the army, as my immortal mother did, who, by that step, transmitted the crown of our ancestors to its legitimate descendants. It is the monarchy itself which now requires to be asserted. Though Dorleans is actively engaged in attempting the dethronement of His Majesty, I do not think the nation will submit to such a prince, or to any other monarchical government, if the present be decidedly destroyed. All these plans, my dear princess, continued she, are mere castles in the air. The mischief is too deeply rooted. As they have already frantically declared for the king's abdication, any strong measure now, incompetent as we are to assure its success, would at once arm the advocates of republicanism to proclaim the king's dethronement. The cruel observations of Petion to His Majesty, on our ever-memorable return from Varennes, have made a deeper impression than you are aware of. When the king observed to him, What do the French nation want? A republic, replied he. And though he has been the means of already costing us some thousands, to crush this unnatural propensity, yet I firmly believe that he himself is at the head of all the civil disorders fomented for its attainment. I am the more confirmed in this opinion from a conversation I had with the good old man, M. de Malherbe, who assured me the great sums we were lavishing on this man were thrown away, for he would be certain, eventually, to betray us, and such an inference could only have been drawn from the lips of the traitor himself. Petion must have given Malherbe reason to believe this. I am daily more and more convinced it will be the case. Yet, were I to show the least energy or activity in support of the king's authority, I should then be accused of undermining it. All France would be up in arms against the danger of female influence. The king would only be lessened in the general opinion of the nation, and the kingly authority still more weakened. Calm submission to his majesty is, therefore, the only safe, course for both of us, and we must wait events. While her majesty was thus opening her heart to me, the king and Princess Elizabeth entered, to inform her that M. Laporte, the head of the private police, had discovered, and caused to be arrested, some of the wretches who had maliciously attempted to fire the palace of the Tilleries. Set them at liberty, exclaimed Her Majesty. Or, to clear themselves and their party, they will accuse us of something worse. Such, too, is my opinion, sire, observed I. For however I abhor their intentions, I have here a letter from one of these miscreants which was found among the combustibles. It cautions us not to inhabit the upper part of the pavilion. My not having paid the attention which was expected to the letter, has aroused the malice of the writer, and caused a second attempt to be made from the Pont Royal upon my own apartment. In preventing which, a worthy man has been cruelly wounded in the arm. Merciful heaven, exclaimed the poor queen and the princess Elizabeth, I not dangerously, I hope. I hope not, added I. But the attempt, and its escaping unpunished, though there were guards all around, is a proof how perilous it will be, while we are so weak, 
to kindle their rancor by any show of impotent resentment. For I have reason to believe it was to that, the want of attention to the letter of which I speak was imputed. The queen took this opportunity, of laying before the king the above-mentioned plan. His majesty, seeing it in the name of Lafayette, took up the paper, and, after he had attentively perused it, tore it in pieces, exclaiming, What? Has not M. Lafayette done mischief enough yet, but must he even expose the names of so many worthy men by committing them to paper at a critical period like this? When he is fully aware that we are in immediate danger of being assailed by a banditti of inhuman cannibals, who would sacrifice every individual attached to us, if, unfortunately, such a paper should be found. I am determined to have nothing to do with his ruinous plans. Popularity and ambition made him the principal promoter of republicanism. Having failed of becoming a Washington, he is mad to become a Cromwell. I have no faith in these turncoat constitutionalists. I know that the Queen heartily concurred in this sentiment concerning General Lafayette, as soon as she ascertained his real character, and discovered that he considered nothing paramount to public notoriety. To this he had sacrificed the interest of his country, and trampled underfoot the throne. But finding he could not succeed in forming a republican government in France as he had in America, he, like many others, lost his popularity with the demagogues, and, when too late, came to offer his services, through me, to the Queen. To recruit a monarchy which his vanity had undermined to gratify, his chimerical ambition. Her Majesty certainly saw him frequently, but never again would she put herself in the way of being betrayed by one whom she considered faithless to all. 45. Here ends the journal of my lamented benefactress. I have continued the history to the close of her career, and that of the royal family, especially as Her Highness herself acted so important a part in many of the scenes, which are so strongly illustrated by her conversation and letters. It is only necessary to add that the papers which I have arranged were received from Her Highness amidst the disasters which were now thickening around her and her royal friends. Section 16 From the time I left Passy till my final departure from Paris for Italy, which took place on the 2nd of August, 1792, my residence was almost exclusively at the capital. The faithful driver, who had given such proofs of probity, continued to be of great service, and was put in perpetual requisition. I was daily about on the business of the queen and the princess, always disguised, and most frequently as a drummer boy, on which occasions the driver and my man-servant were my companions. My principal occupation was to hear and take down the debates of the assembly, and convey and receive letters from the Queen to the Princess de Lambal, to and from Barnave, Bertrand de Molville, Alexander de Lameth, de Port de Furter, du Portail. Montmorin, Turbo, de Mandat, the Duc de Brissac, etc. With whom my illustrious patronesses kept up a continued correspondence, to which I believe all of them fell a sacrifice. For, owing to the imprudence of the king in not removing their communications when he removed the rest of his papers from the Tilleries, the exposure of their connections with the court was necessarily consequent upon the plunder of the palace on the 10th of August, 1792. In my masquerade visits to the assembly, I got acquainted with an editor of one of the papers, I think he told me his name was Duplessy. Being pleased with the liveliness of my remarks on some of the organized disorders, as I termed them, and with some comments I made upon the meanness of certain disgusting speeches on the patriotic gifts. My new acquaintance suffered me to take copies of his own shorthand remarks and reports. By this means the Queen and the Princess had them before they appeared in print. M. Duplessy was on other occasions of great service to me, especially as a protector in the mobs, for my man-servant and the honest driver were so much occupied in watching the movements of the various Faubourg factions that I was often left entirely unattended. The horrors of the Tilleries, both by night and day, were now grown appallingly beyond description. Almost unendurable as they had been before, they were aggravated by the insults of the National Guard to every passenger to and from the palace. I was myself in so much peril, that the princess thought it necessary to procure a trusty person, of tried courage, to see me through the throngs, with a large bandbox of all sorts of fashionable millinery. As the mode of ingress and egress least liable to excite suspicion. 
Thus equipped, and guarded by my chichis bayo, I one day found myself, on entering the tilleries, in the midst of an immense mob of regular trained rioters, who, seeing me go towards the palace, directed their attention entirely to me. They took me for some one belonging to the Queen's milliner, Madame Bertin, who, they said, was fattening upon the public misery, through the Queen's extravagance. The poor Queen herself they called by name so opprobious that decency will not suffer me to repeat them. With a volley of oaths, pressing upon us, they bore us to another part of the garden, for the purpose of compelling us to behold six or eight of the most infamous outcasts, amusing themselves, in a state of exposure with their accursed hands and arms tinged with blood up to the elbows. The spot they had chosen for this exhibition of their filthy persons was immediately before the windows of the apartments of the queen and the ladies of the court. Here they paraded up and down, to the great entertainment of a throng of savage rebels, by whom they were applauded and encouraged with shouts of, Bis. Bis, signifying in English, again. Again. The demoniac interest excited by this scene withdrew the attention of those who were enjoying it from me, and gave me the opportunity of escaping unperceived, merely with the loss of my bandbox. Of that the infuriated mob made themselves masters. And the hats, caps, bonnets, and other articles of female attire, were placed on the parts of their degraded carcasses, which, for the honor of human nature, should have been shot. Overcome with agony at these insults, I burst from the garden in a flood of tears. On passing the gate, I was accosted by a person who exclaimed in a tone of great kindness, Chuas tu, ma bon. Chuas si e ka vu aflige. Knowing the risk I should run in representing the real cause of my concern, I immediately thought of ascribing it to the loss of the property of which I had been plundered. I told him I was a poor milliner, and had been robbed of everything I possessed in the world by the mob. Come back with me, said he, and I will have it restored to you. I knew it was of no avail, but policy stimulated me to comply. And I returned with him into the garden toward the palace. What should I have felt, had I been aware, when this man came up, that I was accosted by the villain Danton? The person who was with me knew him, but dared not speak, and watched a chance of escaping in the crowd for fear of being discovered. When I looked round and found myself alone, I said I had lost my brother in the confusion, which added to my grief. Oh, never mind, said Danton, take hold of my arm, no one shall molest you. We will look for your brother, and try to recover your things. And on we went together, weeping, I may truly say, for my life, stopped at every step, while he related my doleful story to all whose curiosity was excited by my grief. On my appearing arm in arm with Danton before the windows of the Queen's apartments, we were observed by Her Majesty and the Princesses. Their consternation and perplexity, as well as alarm for my safety, may readily be conceived. A signal from the window instantly apprised me that I might enter the palace, to which my return had been for some time impatiently expected. Finding it could no longer be of any service to carry on the farce of seeking my pretended brother, I begged to be escorted out of the mob to the apartments of the Princess de Lambeau. Oh, said Danton, certainly. And if you had only told the people that you were going to that good princess, I am sure your things would not have been taken from you. But, added he, are you perfectly certain they were not for that detestable Marie Antoinette? Oh. I replied, quite, quite certain. All this while the mob was at my heels. Then, said he, I will not leave you till you are safe in the apartments of the Princess de Lamballe, and I will myself make known to her your loss, she is so good, continued he, that I am convinced she will make you just compensation. I then told him how much I should be obliged by his doing so, as I had been commissioned to deliver the things, and if I was made to pay for them, the loss would be more serious than I could bear. Bah! Bah! exclaimed he. Laissez-moi faire. Laissez-moi faire. When he came to the inner door, which I pretended to know nothing about, he told the gentleman of the chamber his name, and said he wished to see his mistress. Her Highness came in a few minutes, and from her looks and visible agitation at the sight of Danton, I feared she would have betrayed both herself and me. However, while he was making a long preamble, I made signs, from which she inferred that all was safe. 
When Danton had finished telling her the story, she calmly said to me, Do you recollect, child, the things you have been robbed of? I replied that, if I had pen and ink, I could even set down the prices. Oh, well, then, child, come in, said Her Highness, and we will see what is to be done. There, exclaimed Danton, did I not tell you this before? Then, giving me a hearty squeeze of the hand, he departed, and thus terminated the millinery speculation, which, I have no doubt, cost Her Highness a tolerable sum. As soon as he was gone, the princess said, For heaven's sake, tell me the whole of this affair candidly, for the queen has been in the greatest agitation at the bare idea of your knowing Danton, ever since we first saw you walking with him. He is one of our most inveterate enemies. I said that if they had but witnessed one half of the scenes that I saw, I was sure their feelings would have been shocked beyond description. We did not see all, but we heard too much for the ears of our sex. I then related the particulars of our meeting to Her Highness, who observed, this accident, however unpleasant, may still turn out to our advantage. This fellow believes you to be a Marchand de Modes, and the circumstance of his having accompanied you to my apartment will enable you, in future, to pass to and from the pavilion unmolested by the National Guard. With tears of joy in her eyes for my safety, she could not, however, help laughing when I told her the farce I kept up respecting the loss of my brother, and my bandbox with the millinery. For which I was also soon congratulated most graciously by Her Majesty, who much applauded my spirit and presence of mind, and condescended, immediately, to entrust me with letters of the greatest importance. For some of the most distinguished members of the assembly, with which I left the palace in triumph, but taking care to be ready with a proper story of my losses. When I passed the guard room, I was pitted by the very wretches, who, perhaps, had already shared in the spoils, and who would have butchered me, no doubt, into the bargain, could they have penetrated the real object of my mission. They asked me if I had been paid for the loss I sustained. I told them I had not, but I was promised that it should be settled. Settled, said one of the wretches. Get the money as soon as you can. Do not trust to promises of its being settled. They will all be settled themselves soon. The next day, on going to the palace, I found the Princess de Lamballe in the greatest agitation, from the accounts the court had just received of the murder of a man belonging to Arthur Dillon, and of the massacres at Nantes. The horrid prints, pamphlets, and caricatures, cried she, daily exhibited under the very windows of the Tilleries, against His Majesty, the Queen, the Austrian party, and the Koblenz party, the constant thwarting of every plan. And these last horrors at Nantes, have so overwhelmed the king that he is nearly become a mere automaton. Daily and nightly execrations are howled in his ears. Look at our boasted deliverers. The poor queen, her children, and all of us belonging to the palace, are in danger of our lives at merely being seen. While they by whom we have been so long buoyed up with hope are quarreling amongst themselves for the honor and etiquette of precedency, leaving us to the fury of a race of cannibals, who know no mercy and will have destroyed us long before their disputes of etiquette can be settled. The utterance of Her Highness while saying this was rendered almost inarticulate by her tears. What support against internal disorganization, continued she, is to be expected from so disorganized a body as the present army of different nations, having all different interests. I said there was no doubt that the Prussian army was on its march, and would soon be joined by that of the princes and of Austria. You speak as you wish, mia cara Inglesina, but it is all to no purpose. Would to God they had never been applied to, never been called upon to interfere. Oh, that Her Majesty could have been persuaded to listen to Dumerir and some other of the members, instead of relying on suckers which, I fear, will never enter Paris in our lifetime. No army can subdue a nation especially a nation frenzied by the recent recovery of its freedom and independence from the shackles of a corrupt and weak administration. The king is too good, the queen has no equal as to heart, but they have both been most grossly betrayed. The royalists on one side, the constitutionalists on the other, will be the victims of the Jacobins, for they are the most powerful, they are the most united, they possess the most talent, and they act in a body, and not merely for the time being. Believe me, my dear, their plans are too well grounded to be defeated, 
as every one framed by the fallacious constitutionalists and mad-headed royalists has been, and so they will ever be while they continue to form two separate interests. From the very first moment when these two bodies were worked upon separately, I told the Queen that, till they were united for the same object, the monarchy would be unsafe, and at the mercy of the Jacobins, who, from hatred to both parties, would overthrow it themselves to rule despotically over those whom they no longer respected or feared, but whom they hated, as considering them both equally their former oppressors. May the all-seeing power, continued Her Highness, grant, for the good of this shattered state, that I may be mistaken, and that my predictions may prove different in the result. But of this I see no hope, unless in the strength of our own internal resources. God knows how powerful they might prove could they be united at this moment. But from the anarchy and division kept up between them, I see no prospect of their being brought to bear, except in a general overthrow of this, as you have justly observed, organized system of disorders. From which at some future period we may obtain a solid, systematic order of government. Would Charles II ever have reigned after the murder of his father had England been torn to pieces by different factions? No. It was the union of the body of the nation for its internal tranquility, the amalgamation of parties against domestic faction, which gave vigor to the arm of power, and enabled the nation to check foreign interference abroad. While it annihilated anarchy at home. By that means the protector himself laid the first stone of the restoration. The division of a nation is the surest harbinger of success to its invaders, the death blow to its sovereign's authority, and the total destruction of that innate energy by which alone a country can obtain the dignity of its own independence. Section 17 While Her Highness was thus pondering on the dreadful situation of France, strengthening her arguments by those historical illustrations, which, from the past, enabled her to look into the future. A message came to her from Her Majesty. She left me, and, in a few minutes, returned to her apartment, accompanied by the Queen and Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth. I was greatly surprised at seeing these two illustrious and august personages bathed in tears. Of course, I could not be aware of any new motive to create any new or extraordinary emotion, yet there was in the countenances of all of the party an appearance different from anything I had ever witnessed in them or any other person before. A something which seemed to say, they no longer had any affinity with the rest of earthly beings. They had all been just writing to their distant friends and relations. A fatal presentiment, alas! Too soon verified, told them it was for the last time. Her Highness the Princess de Lamballe now approached me. Her Majesty, observed the Princess, wishes to give you a mark of her esteem, in delivering to you, with her own hands, letters to her family, which it is her intention to entrust to your especial care. On this step Her Majesty has resolved, as much to send you out of the way of danger, as from the conviction occasioned by the firm reliance your conduct has created in us, that you will faithfully obey the orders you may receive. And execute our intentions with that peculiar intelligence which the emergency of the case requires. But even the desirable opportunity which offers, through you, for the accomplishment of her mission, might not have prevailed with Her Majesty to hasten your departure. Had not the wretch Danton twice inquired at the palace for the little milliner, whom he rescued and conducted safe to the apartments of the pavilion of Flora. This, probably, may be a matter of no real consequence whatever, but it is our duty to avoid danger, and it has been decided that you should, at least for a time, absent Paris. Per CIO, mia cara Inglesina, speak now, freely and candidly, is it your wish to return to England, or go elsewhere? For though we are all sorry to lose you, yet it would be a source of still greater sorrow to us, prizing your services and fidelity as we do, should any plans and purposes of ours lead you into difficulty or embarrassment. Oh, mon Dieu! Save Ray, interrupted Her Majesty, her eyes at the same time filled with tears. I should never forgive myself, continued the princess, if I should prove the cause of any misfortune to you. Nor I, most graciously subjoined the queen. Therefore, pursued the princess, speak your mind without reserve. Hear my own feelings, and the sobs of the illustrious party, completely overcame me, and I could not proceed. The princess de Lamballe clasped me in her arms. 
Not only letters, exclaimed she, but my life I would trust to the fidelity of my Vera, Verissima, Cara Inglesina. And now, continued her highness, turning round to the queen, will it please your majesty to give Inglesina your commands. Here, then, said the queen, is a letter for my dear sister, the queen of Naples, which you must deliver into her own hands. Here is another for my sister, the Duchess of Parma. If she should not be at Parma, you will find her at Colerno. This is for my brother, the Archduke of Milan, this for my sister-in-law, the Princess Clotilde Piedmont, at Turin, and here are four others. You will take off the envelope when you get to Turin, and then put them into the post yourself. Do not give them to, or send them by, any person whatsoever. Tell my sisters the state of Paris. Inform them of our cruel situation. Describe the riots and convulsions you have seen. Above all, assure them how dear they are to me, and how much I love them. At the word love, Her Majesty threw herself on a sofa and wept bitterly. The Princess Elizabeth gave me a letter for her sister, and two for her aunts, to be delivered to them, if at Rome, but if not, to be put under cover and sent through the post at Rome to whatever place they might have made their residence. I had also a packet of letters to deliver for the Princess de Lamballe at Turin, and another for the Duc de Serboloni at Milan. Her Majesty and the Princess Elizabeth not only allowed me the honour to kiss their hands, but they, both gave me their blessing, and good wishes for my safe return, and then left me with the Princess de Lamballe. Her Majesty had scarcely left the apartment of the Princess, when I recollected she had forgotten to give me the cipher and the key for the letters. The princess immediately went to the queen's apartment, and returned with them shortly after. Now that we are alone, said her highness, I will tell you what her majesty has graciously commanded me to signify to you in her royal name. The queen commands me to say that you are provided for for life. And that, on the first vacancy which may occur, she intends fixing you at court. Therefore mia cara Inglesina, take especial care what you are about, and obey Her Majesty's wishes when you are absent, as implicitly as you have hitherto done all her commands during your abode near her. You are not to write to any one. No one is to be made acquainted with your route. You are not to leave Paris in your own carriage. It will be sent after you by your man-servant, who is to join you at challen sur -Sone. I have further to inform you that Her Majesty the Queen, on sending you the cipher, has at the same time graciously condescended to add these presents as further marks of her esteem. Her Highness then showed me a most beautiful gold watch, chain and seals. These, said she, placing them with her own hands, Her Majesty desired me to put round your neck in testimony of her regard. At the same time Her Highness presented me, on her own part, with a beautiful pocketbook, the covers of which were of gold enameled, with the word, souvenir, in diamonds on one side, and a large cipher of her own initials on the other. The first page contained the names of the Queen and Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth, in their own handwriting. There was a check in it on a Swiss banker, at Milan, of the name of Bonnie. Having given me these invaluable tokens, Her Highness proceeded with her instructions. At Challen, continued she, Mia Cara, your man-servant will perhaps bring you other letters. Take two places in the stage for yourself and your femme de chamber, in her name, and give me the memorandum, that our old friend, the driver, may procure the passports. You must not be seen. For there is no doubt that Danton has given the police a full description of your person. Now go and prepare, we shall see each other again before your departure. Only a few minutes afterwards my man-servant came to me to say that it would be some hours before the stage would set off, and that there was a lady in her carriage waiting for me in the Bois de Boulogne. I hastened thither. What was my surprise on finding it was the princess? I now saw her for the last time. Let me pass lightly over this sad moment. I must not, however, dismiss the subject, without noticing the visible changes which had taken place in the short space of a month, in the appearance of all these illustrious princesses. Their very complexions were no longer the same, as if grief had changed the whole mass of their blood. The Queen, in particular, from the month of July to the 2d of August, looked ten years older. The other two princesses were really worn out with fatigue, 
anxiety, and the want of rest, as, during the whole month of July, they scarcely ever slept, for fear of being murdered in their beds, and only threw themselves on them, now and then. Without undressing. The king, three or four times in the night, would go round to their different apartments, fearful they might be destroyed in their sleep, and ask, Eats vous la, when they would answer him from within, new psalms encore ici. Indeed, if, when nature was exhausted, sleep by chance came to the relief of their worn-out and languid frames, it was only to awaken them to fresh horrors, which constantly threatened the convulsion by which they were finally annihilated. It would be uncandid in me to be silent concerning the marked difference I found in the feelings of the two royal sisters of Her Majesty. I had never had the honour before to execute any commissions for Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Parma, and, of course, took that city in my way to Naples. I did not reach Parma till after the horrors which had taken place at the Tilleries on the 10th of August, 1792. The whole of the unfortunate royal family of France were then lodged in the temple. There was not a feeling heart in Europe unmoved at their afflicting situation. I arrived at Calerno, the country residence of the Duchess of Parma, just as Her Royal Highness was going out on horseback. I ordered my servant to inform one of the pages that I came by express from Paris, and requested the honour to know when it would be convenient for Her Royal Highness to allow me a private audience, as I was going, post-haste, to Rome and Naples. Of course, I did not choose to tell my business either to my own or Her Royal Highness's servant, being in honour and duty bound to deliver the letter and the verbal message of her then truly unfortunate sister in person and in privacy. The mention of Paris I saw somewhat startled and confused her. Meantime, she came near enough to my carriage for me to say to her in German, in order that none of the servants, French or Italian, might understand, that I had a letter to deliver into her own hands, without saying from whom. She then desired I would alight, and she soon followed me, and, after having very graciously ordered me some refreshments, asked me from whom I had been sent. I delivered Her Majesty's letter. Before she opened it, she exclaimed, O oh Dio! Tuto e perduto e troppo tardi! Oh, God! All is lost, it is too late! I then gave her the cipher and the key. In a few minutes I enabled her to decipher the letter. On getting through it, she again exclaimed, E tuto inutile. It is entirely useless. I am afraid they are all lost. I am sorry you are so situated as not to allow of your remaining here to rest from your fatigue. Whenever you come to Parma, I shall be glad to see you. She then took out her pocket handkerchief, shed a few tears, and said that, as circumstances were now so totally changed, to answer the letter might only commit her, her sister, and myself. But that if affairs took the turn she wished, no doubt, her sister would write again. She then mounted her horse, and wished me a good journey, and I took leave, and set off for Rome. I must confess that the conduct of the Duchess of Parma appeared to me rather cold, if not unfeeling. Perhaps she was afraid of showing too much emotion, and wished to encourage the idea that princesses ought not to give way to sensibility, like common mortals. But how different was the conduct of the Queen of Naples! She kissed the letter, she bathed it with her tears. Scarcely could she allow herself time to decipher it. At every sentence she exclaimed, Oh, my dear, oh, my adored sister! What will become of her? My brothers are now both no more. Surely, she will soon be liberated. Then, turning suddenly to me, she asked with eagerness, do you not think she will? Oh, Marie, Marie! Why did she not fly to Vienna? Why did she not come to me instead of writing? Tell me, for God's sake, all you know. I said I knew nothing further of what had taken place at Paris, having travelled night and day, except what I had heard from the different couriers, which I had met and stopped on my route. But I hoped to be better informed by Sir William Hamilton, as all my letters were to be sent from France to Turin, and thence on to Sir William at Naples. And if I found no letters with him, I should immediately set off and return to Turin or Milan, to be as near France as possible for my speedy return if necessary. 
I ventured to add that it was my earnest prayer that all the European sovereigns would feel the necessity of interesting themselves for the royal family of France, with whose fate the fate of monarchy throughout Europe might be interwoven. Oh, God of heaven, cried the queen, all that dear family may ere now have been murdered. Perhaps they are already numbered among the dead. Oh, my poor, dear, beloved Marie. Oh, I shall go frantic. I must send for General Acton. Wringing her hands, she pulled the bell, and in a few minutes the general came. On his entering the apartment, she flew to him like one deprived of reason. There, exclaimed she. There. Behold the fatal consequences, showing him the letter. Louis the Sixteenth is in the state of Charles the First of England, and my sister will certainly be murdered. No, 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 exclaimed the general. Something will be done. Calm yourself, madam. Then turning to me, when, said he, did you leave Paris? When all was lost, interrupted the queen. Nay, cried the general, pray let me speak. All is not lost, you will find have but a little patience. Patience, said the queen. For two years I have heard of nothing else. Nothing has been done for these unfortunate beings. She then threw herself into a chair. Tell him, cried she to me, tell him. Tell him. I then informed the general that I had left Paris on the 2d of August, but did not believe at the time, though the daily riots were horrible, that such a catastrophe could have occurred so soon as eight days after. The Queen was now quite exhausted, and General Acton rang the bell for the lady-in-waiting, who entered accompanied by the Duchesse Curiliano Marini, and they assisted Her Majesty to bed. When she had retired, do not, said the General to me, do not go to Sir William's tonight. He is at case root. You seem too much fatigued. More from grief, replied I, and reflection on the fatal consequences that might result to the great personages I have so lately left, than from the journey. Take my advice, resumed he. You had much better go to bed and rest yourself. You look very ill. I did as he recommended, and went to the nearest hotel I could find. I felt no fatigue of mind or body till I had got into bed, where I was confined for several days with a most violent fever. During my illness I received every attention both from the court, and our ambassador and Lady Hamilton, who kindly visited me every day. The Queen of Naples I never again saw till my return in 1793, after the murder of the Queen of France. And I am glad I did not, for her agony would have acted anew upon my disordered frame, and might have proved fatal. I was certainly somewhat prepared for a difference of feeling between the two princesses, as the unfortunate Marie Antoinette, in the letters to the Queen of Naples, always wrote, to my much beloved sister, the Queen of the Two Sicilies, etc. And to the other, merely, to the Duchess of Parma, etc. But I could never have dreamt of a difference so little flattering, under such circumstances, to the Duchess of Parma. Section 18 from the moment of my departure from Paris on the 2d of August, 1792, the tragedy hastened to its denouement. On the night of the 9th, the tocsin was sounded, and the king and the royal family looked upon their fate as sealed. Notwithstanding the personal firmness of his majesty, he was a coward for others. He dreaded the responsibility of ordering blood to be shed, even in defense of his nearest and dearest interests. Petion, however, had given the order to repel force by force to demand that, who was murdered upon the steps of the Hotel de Ville. It has been generally supposed that Petion had received a bribe for not ordering the cannon against the Tilleries on the night of the 9th. And that de Mandat was massacred by the agents of Petion for the purpose of extinguishing all proof that he was only acting under the instructions of the mayor. I shall not undertake to judge of the propriety of the king's impression that there was no safety from the insurgents but in the hall, and under the protection of the assembly. Had the members been well disposed towards him, the event might have proved very different. But there is one thing certain. The queen would never have consented to this step but to save the king and her innocent children. She would have preferred death to the humiliation of being under obligations to her sworn enemies but she was overcome by the king declaring, 
with tears in his eyes, that he would not quit the palace without her. The princesses Elizabeth and de Lamballe fell at her feet, implored Her Majesty to obey the king, and assured her there was no alternative between instant death and refuge from it in the assembly. Well, said the queen, if our lot be death, let us away to receive it with the national sanction. I need not expatiate on the succession of horrors which now overwhelmed the royal sufferers. Their confinement at the Fulans, and their subsequent transfer to the temple, are all topics sufficiently enlarged upon by many who were actors in the scenes to which they led. The Princess de Lamballe was, while it was permitted, the companion of their captivity. But the consolation of her society was considered too great to be continued. Her fate had no doubt been predetermined. And, unwilling to await the slow proceedings of a trial, which it was thought politic should precede the murder of her royal mistress, it was found necessary to detach her from the wretched inmates of the temple. In order to have her more completely within the control of the miscreants, who hated her for her virtues. The expedient was resorted to of casting suspicion upon the correspondence which Her Highness kept up with the exterior of the prison, for the purpose of obtaining such necessaries as were required. In consequence of the utter destitution in which the royal family retired from the Tilleries, two men, of the names of Devine and Priquet, were bribed to create a suspicion, by their informations against the Queen's female attendant. The first declared that on the 18th of August, while he was on duty near the cell of the king, he saw a woman about eleven o'clock in the day come from a room in the centre, holding in one hand three letters. And with the other cautiously opening the door of the right-hand chamber, whence she presently came back without the letters and returned into the centre chamber. He further asserted that twice, when this woman opened the door, he distinctly saw a letter half-written, and every evidence of an eagerness to hide it from observation. The second informant, Priquet, swore that, while on duty as morning sentinel on the gallery between the two towers, he saw, through the window of the central chamber, a woman writing with great earnestness and alarm during the whole time he was on guard. All the ladies were immediately summoned before the authorities. The hour of the separation between the princess and her royal friend accorded with the solemnity of the circumstance. It was nearly midnight when they were torn asunder, and they never met again. The examinations were all separate. That of the Princess de Lamballe was as follows. Q. Your name. A. marie therese Louise de Savoy, Bourbon Lamballe. Q. What do you know of the events which occurred on the 10th of August? A. Nothing. Q. Where did you pass that day? A. As a relative I followed the King to the National Assembly. Q. Were you in bed on the nights of the 9th and 10th? A. No. Q. Where were you then? A. In my apartments, at the chateau. Q. Did you not go to the apartments of the king in the course of that night? A. Finding there was a likelihood of a commotion, went thither towards one in the morning. Q. You were aware, then, that the people had arisen. A. I learnt it from hearing the tocsin. Q. Did you see the Swiss and National Guards, who passed the night on the terrace? A. I was at the window, but saw neither. Q. Was the king in his apartment when you went thither? A. There were a great number of persons in the room, but not the king. Q. Did you know of the mayor of Paris being at the Tilleries? A. I heard he was there. Q. At what hour did the king go to the National Assembly? A. 7. Q. Did he not, before he went, review the troops? Do you know the oath he made them swear? A. I never heard of any oath. Q. Have you any knowledge of cannon being mounted and pointed in the apartments? A. No. Q. Have you ever seen Messrs. Mandat and D'Affry in the chateau? A. No. Q. Do you know the secret doors of the Tilleries? A. I know of no such doors. Q. Have you not, since you have been in the temple, received and written letters, which you sought to send away secretly? A. I have never received or written any letters, excepting such as have been delivered to the municipal officer. Q. Do you know anything of an article of furniture which is making for Madame Elizabeth? A. No. 
Q. Have you not recently received some devotional books? A. No. Q. What are the books which you have at the temple? A. I have none. Q. Do you know anything of a barred staircase? A. No. Q. What general officers did you see at the Tilleries, on the nights of the 9th and 10th? A. I saw no general officers, I only saw M. Roterer. For thirteen hours was Her Highness, with her female companions in misfortune, exposed to these absurd forms, and to the gaze of insulting and malignant curiosity. At length, about the middle of the day, they were told that it was decreed that they should be detained till further orders, leaving them the choice of prisons, between that of La Force and of La Salpetrier. Her Highness immediately decided on the former. It was at first determined that she should be separated from Madame de Tourzel, but humanity so far prevailed as to permit the consolation of her society, with that of others of her friends and fellow sufferers. And for a moment the princess enjoyed the only comfort left to her, that of exchanging sympathy with her partners in affliction. But the cell to which she was doomed proved her last habitation upon earth. On the 1st of September the Marseillois began their murderous operations. Three hundred persons in two days massacred upwards of a thousand defenseless prisoners, confined under the pretext of malpractices against the state, or rather devotedness to the royal cause. The spirit which produced the massacres of the prisons at Paris extended them through the principal towns and cities all over France. Even the universal interest felt for the Princesse de Lamballe was of no avail against this frenzy. I remember once, as if it were from a presentiment of what was to occur, the king observing to her, I never knew any but fools and sycophants who could keep themselves clear from the lash of public censure. How is it, then, that you, my dear princess, who are neither, contrive to steer your bark on this dangerous coast without running against the rocks on which so many good vessels like your own have been dashed to pieces? Oh, sire, replied her highness, my time is not yet come, I am not dead yet. Too soon, and too horribly, her hour did come. The butchery of the prisons was now commenced. The Duc de Penthievre set every engine in operation to save his beloved daughter-in-law. He sent for Manuel, who was then procurer of Paris. The Duke declared that half his fortune should be Manuel's if he could but save the Princess de Lamballe and the ladies who were in the same prison with her from the general massacre. Manuel promised the Duke that he would instantly set about removing them all from the reach of the bloodhunters. He began with those whose removal was least likely to attract attention, leaving the Princess de Lamballe, from motives of policy, to the last. Meanwhile, other messengers had been dispatched to different quarters for fear of failure with Manuel. It was discovered by one of these that the atrocious tribunal, Thibado, Hébert, Simonier, etc., who sat in mock judgment upon the tenants of these gloomy abodes, after satiating themselves with every studied insult they could devise, were to pronounce the word Libra. It was naturally presumed that the predestined victims, on hearing this tempting sound, and seeing the doors at the same moment set open by the clerks of the infamous court, would dart off in exultation, and, fancying themselves liberated, rush upon the knives of the barbarians, who were outside, in waiting for their blood. Hundreds were thus slaughtered. To save the princess from such a sacrifice, it was projected to prevent her from appearing before the tribunal, and a belief was encouraged that means would be devised to elude the necessity. The person who interested himself for her safety contrived to convey a letter containing these words, Let what will happen, for God's sake do not quit your cell. You will be spared. Adieu. Manuel, however, who knew not of this cross arrangement, was better informed than its projector. He was aware it would be impossible for Her Highness to escape from appearing before the tribunal. He had already removed her companions. The Princess de Tarente, the Marquise de Tourzel, her daughter, and others, were in safety. But when, true to his promise, he went to the Princess de Lamballe, she would not be prevailed upon to quit her cell. There was no time for parley. The letter prevailed, and her fate was inevitable. The massacre had begun at daybreak. The fiends had been some hours busy in the work of death. 
The piercing shrieks of the dying victims brought the princess and her remaining companion upon their knees, in fervent prayer for the souls of the departed. The messengers of the tribunal now appeared. The princess was compelled to attend the summons. She went, accompanied by her faithful female attendant. A glance at the seas of blood, of which she caught a glimpse upon her way to the court, had nearly shocked her even to sudden death. Would it had. She staggered, but was sustained by her companion. Her courage triumphed. She appeared before the Gorstein tribunes. After some questions of mere form, Her Highness was commanded to swear to be faithful to the new order of government, and to hate the king, the queen, and royalty. To the first, replied Her Highness, I willingly submit. To the second, how can I accede? There is nothing of which I can accuse the royal family. To hate them is against my nature. They are my sovereigns. They are my friends and relations. I have served them for many years, and never have I found reason for the slightest complaint. The princess could no longer articulate. She fell into the arms of her attendant. The fatal signal was pronounced. She recovered, and, crossing the court of the prison, which was bathed with the blood of mutilated victims, involuntarily exclaimed, Gracious heaven! What a sight is this, and fell into a fit. Nearest to her in the mob stood a mulatto, whom she had caused to be baptized, educated, and maintained, but whom, for ill conduct, she had latterly excluded from her presence. This miscreant struck at her with his halberd. The blow removed her cap. Her luxuriant hair, as if to hide her angelic beauty from the sight of the murderers, pressing tiger-like around to pollute that form. The virtues of which equaled its physical perfection, her luxuriant hair fell around and veiled her a moment from view. An individual, to whom I was nearly allied, seeing the miscreant somewhat staggered, sprang forward to the rescue, but the mulatto wounded him. The princess was lost to all feeling from the moment the monster first struck at her. But the demons would not quit their prey. She expired gashed with wounds. Scarcely was the breath out of her body, when the murderers cut off her head. One party of them fixed it, like that of the vilest traitor, on an immense pole, and bore it in triumph all over Paris, while another division of the outrageous cannibals were occupied in tearing her clothes piecemeal from her mangled corpse. The beauty of that form, though headless, mutilated and reeking with the hot blood of their foul crime, how shall I describe it? Excited that atrocious excess of lust, which impelled these hordes of assassins to satiate their demoniac passions upon the remains of this virtuous angel. This incredible crime being perpetrated, the wretches fastened ropes round the body, arms, and legs, and dragged it naked through the streets of Paris, till no vestige remained by which it could be distinguished as belonging to the human species. And then left it among the hundreds of innocent victims of that awful day, who were heaped up to putrefy in one confused and disgusting mass. The head was reserved for other purposes of cruelty and horror. It was first borne to the temple, beneath the windows of the royal prisoners. The wretches who were hired daily to insult them in their dens of misery, by proclaiming all the horrors vomited from the national Vesuvius, were commissioned to redouble their howls of what had befallen the Princess de Lambeau. 46. The Queen sprang up at the name of her friend. She heard subjoined to, it, la voila en triomphe, and then came shouts and laughter. She looked out. At a distance she perceived something like a bacchanalian procession, and thought, as she hoped, that the princess was coming to her in triumph from her prison, and her heart rejoiced in the anticipation of once more being, blessed with her society. But the king, who had seen and heard more distinctly from his apartment, flew to that of the queen. That the horrid object might not escape observation, the monsters had mounted upon each other's shoulders so as to lift the bleeding head quite up to the prison bars. The king came just in time to snatch her majesty from the spot, and thus she was prevented from seeing it. He took her up in his arms and carried her to a distant part of the temple, but the mob pursued her in her retreat, and howled the fatal truth even at her, very door, adding that her head would be the next, the nation would require. Her majesty fell into violent hysterics. The butchers of human flesh continued in the interior of the temple, parading the triumph of their assassination, 
until the shrieks of the Princess Elizabeth at the state in which she saw the Queen. And serious fears for the safety of the royal prisoners, aroused the Commandant to treble the National Guards and chase the barbarians to the outside, where they remained for hours. Section 19 It now remains for me to complete my record by a few facts and observations relating to the illustrious victims who a short time survived the Princess de Lambeau. I shall add to this painful narrative some details which have been mentioned to me concerning their remorseless persecutors, who were not long left unpursued by just and awful retribution. Having done this, I shall dismiss the subject. The execrable and sacrilegious modern French Pharisees, who butchered, on the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of September, 1792, all the prisoners at Paris. By these massacres only gave the signal for the more diabolical machinations which led to the destruction of the still more sacred victims of the 21st of January, and the 16th of October, 1793, and the myriads who followed. The king himself never had a doubt with regard to his ultimate fate. His only wish was to make it the means of emancipation for the queen and royal family. It was his intention to appeal to the National Assembly upon the subject, after his trial. Such also was the particular wish of his saint-like sister, the Princess Elizabeth, who imagined that an appeal under such circumstances could not be resisted. But the Queen strongly opposed the measure. And His Majesty said he should be loath, in the last moments of his painful existence, in anything to thwart one whom he loved so tenderly. He had long accustomed himself, when he spoke of the Queen and royal infants, in deference to the temper of the times, only to say, my wife and children. They, as he told Clary, formed a tie, and the only one remaining, which still bound him to earth. Their last embraces, he said, went so to his aching heart, that he could even yet feel their little hands clinging about him, and see their streaming eyes, and hear their agonized and broken voices. The day previous to the fatal catastrophe, when permitted for the last time to see his family, the Princess Elizabeth whispered him, not for herself, but for the Queen and his helpless innocence, to remember his intentions. He said he should not feel himself happy if, in his last hour, he did not give them a proof of his paternal affection, in obtaining an assurance that the sacrifice of his life should be the guarantee of theirs. So intent was his mind upon this purpose, said Clary to me, that when his assassins came to take him to the slaughtering place, he said, I hope my death will appease the nation, and that my innocent family, who have suffered on my account, will now be released. The ruffians answered, The nation, always magnanimous, only seeks to punish the guilty. You may be assured your family will be respected. Events have proved how well they kept their word. It was to fulfill the intention of recommending his family to the people with his dying breath that he commenced his address upon the scaffold, when Santerre ordered the drums to drown his last accents, and the axe to fall. The Princess Elizabeth, and perhaps others of the royal prisoners, hoped he would have been reprieved, till Herbert, that real, père du chain, with a smile upon his countenance came triumphantly to announce to the disconsolate family that Louis was no more. Perhaps there never was a king more misrepresented and less understood, especially by the immediate age in which he lived, than Louis XVI. He was the victim of natural timidity, increased by the horror of bloodshed, which the exigencies of the times rendered indispensable to his safety. He appeared weak in intellect, when he was only so from circumstances. An overwrought anxiety to be just made him hesitate about the mode of overcoming the abuses, until its procrastination had destroyed the object of his wishes. He had courage sufficient, as well as decision, where others were not menaced and the danger was confined to himself, but, where his family or his people were involved, he was utterly unfit to give direction. The want of self-sufficiency in his own faculties have been his, and his thrones, ruin. He consulted those who caused him to swerve from the path his own better reason had dictated, and, in seeking the best course, he often chose the worst. The same fatal timidity which pervaded his character extended to his manners. From being merely awkward, he at last became uncouth. But from the natural goodness of his heart, the nearest to him soon lost sight of his ungentleness from the rectitude of his intentions, and, to parody the poet, saw his deportment in his feelings. Previous to the Revolution, Louis XVI. 
was generally considered gentle and affable, though never polished. But the numberless outrages suffered by his queen, his family, his friends, and himself, especially towards the close of his career, soured him to an air of rudeness, utterly foreign to his nature and to his intention. It must not be forgotten that he lived in a time of unprecedented difficulty. He was a lamb governing tigers. So far as his own personal bearing is concerned, who is there among his predecessors, that, replaced upon the throne, would have resisted the vicissitudes brought about by internal discord, rebellion, and riot, like himself? What said he when one of the heterogeneous, plebeian, revolutionary assemblies not only insulted him, but added to the insult a laugh? If you think you can govern better, I am ready to resign, was the mild but firm reply of Lewis. How glorious would have been the triumph for the most civilized nation in the center of Europe had the insulter taken him at his word. When the experimentalists did attempt to govern, we all know, and have too severely felt, the consequences. Yet this unfortunate monarch has been represented to the world as imbecile, and taxed with wanting character, firmness, and fortitude, because he has been vanquished. The despot conqueror has been vanquished since. His acquirements were considerable. His memory was remarkably retentive and well stored, a quality, I should infer from all I have observed, common to most sovereigns. By the multiplicity of persons they are in the habit of seeing, and the vast variety of objects continually passing through their minds, this faculty is kept in perpetual exercise. But the circumstance which probably injured Louis XVI more than any other was his familiarity with the locksmith. Gammon. Innocent as was the motive whence it arose, this low connection lessened him more with the whole nation than if he had been the most vicious of princes. How careful sovereigns ought to be, with respect to the attention they bestow on men in humble life. Especially those whose principles may have been demoralized by the meanness of the associations consequent upon their occupation, and whose low origin may have denied them opportunities of intellectual cultivation. This observation map even be extended to the liberal arts. It does not follow because a monarch is fond of these that he should so far forget himself as to make their professors his boon companions. He loses ground whenever he places his inferiors on a level with himself. Men are estimated from the deference they pay to their own stations in society. The great Frederick of Prussia used to sap, I must show myself a king, because my trade is royalty. It was only in destitution and anguish that the real character of Louis developed itself. He was firm and patient, utterly regardless of himself, but wrung to the heart for others, not even excepting his deluded murderers. Nothing could swerve him from his trust in heaven, and he left a glorious example of how far religion can triumph over every calamity and every insult this world has power to inflict. There was a national guard, who, at the time of the imprisonment of the royal family, was looked upon as the most violent of Jacobins, and the sworn enemy of royalty. On that account the sanguinary agents of the self-created assembly employed him to frequent the temple. His special commission was to stimulate the king and royal family by every possible argument to self-destruction. But this man was a friend in disguise. He undertook the hateful office merely to render every service in his power, and convey regular information of the plots of the assembly against those whom he was deputed to persecute. The better to deceive his companions, he would read aloud to the royal family all the debates of the regicides, which those who were with him encouraged, believing it meant to torture and insult. When the real motive was to prepare them to meet every accusation, by communicating to them each charge as it occurred. So thoroughly were the assembly deceived, that the friendly guard was allowed free access to the apartments, in order to facilitate, as was imagined, his wish to agonize and annoy. By this means, he was enabled to caution the illustrious prisoners never to betray any emotion at what he read, and to rely upon his doing his best to soften the rigor of their fate. The individual of whom I speak communicated these circumstances to me himself. He declared, also, that the Duc d'Orleans came frequently to the temple during the imprisonment of Louis XVI, but, always in disguise. And never, till within a few days after the murder of the poor king, did he disclose himself. 
On that occasion he had bribed the men who were accustomed to light the fires, to admit him in their stead to the apartment of the Princess Elizabeth. He found her on her knees, in fervent prayer for the departed soul of her beloved brother. He performed this office, totally unperceived by this predestined victim, but his courage was subdued by her piety. He dared not extend the stratagem to the apartment of the queen. On leaving the angelic princess, he was so overcome by remorse that he, requested my informant to give him a glass of water, saying, that woman has unmanned me. It was by this circumstance he was discovered. The queen was immediately apprised by the good man of the occurrence. Gracious God! exclaimed Her Majesty, I thought once or twice that I had seen him at our miserable dinner hours, occupied with the other jailers at the outside door. I even mentioned the circumstance to Elizabeth, and she replied, I also have observed a man resembling Dorleans, but it cannot be he, for the man I noticed had a wooden leg. That was the very disguise he was discovered in this morning, when preparing, or pretending to prepare, the fire in the Princess Elizabeth's apartment, replied the National Guard. Merciful heaven, said the Queen, is he not yet satisfied? Must he even satiate his barbarous brutality with being an eyewitness of the horrid state into which he has thrown us? Save me, continued Her Majesty, oh, save me from contaminating my feeble sight, which is almost exhausted, nearly parched up for the loss of my dear husband, by looking on him, O, oh, death. Come, come and release me from such a sight. Luckily, observed the guard to me, it was the hour of the general jail dinner, and we were alone. Otherwise, I should infallibly have been discovered, as my tears fell faster than those of the queen, for really hers seemed to be nearly exhausted, however, pursued he, that Dorleans did see the queen, and that the queen saw him, I am very sure. From what passed between them in the month of July, 1793, she was hurried off from the temple to the common prison, to take her trial. This circumstance combined, with other motives, to make the assembly hasten the duke's trial soon after, who had been sent with his young son to Marseilles, there being no doubt that he wished to rescue the queen, so as to have her in his own power. On the 16th of October, Her Majesty was beheaded. Her death was consistent with her life. She met her fate like a Christian, but still like a queen. Perhaps, had Marie Antoinette been uncontrolled in the exercise of her judgment, she would have shown a spirit in emergency better adapted to wrestle with the times than had been discovered by His Majesty. Certain it is she was generally esteemed the most proper to be consulted of the two. From the imperfect idea which many of the persons in office entertained of the king's capacity, few of them ever made any communication of importance but to the queen. Her majesty never kept a single circumstance from her husband's knowledge, and scarcely decided on the smallest trifle without his consent. But so thorough was his confidence in the correctness of her judgment that he seldom, if ever, opposed her decisions. The Princess de Lamballe used to say, though Marie Antoinette is not a woman of great or uncommon talents. Yet her long practical knowledge gave her an insight into matters of moment which she turned to advantage with so much coolness and address amid difficulties. That I am convinced she only wanted free scope to have shown in the history of princes as a great queen. Her natural tendencies were perfectly domestic. Had she been kept in countenance by the manners of the times, or favored earlier by circumstances, she would have sought her only pleasures in the family circle, and, far from court intrigue, have become the model of her sex and age. It is by no means to be wondered at that, in her peculiar situation, surrounded by a thoughtless and dissipated court, long denied the natural ties so necessary to such a heart, in the heyday of youth and beauty. And possessing an animated and lively spirit, she should have given way in the earlier part of her career to gaiety, and been pleased with a round of amusement. The sincere friendship which she afterwards formed for the Duchesse de Polignac encouraged this predilection. The plot to destroy her had already been formed, and her enemies were too sharp-sighted and adroit not to profit and take advantage of the opportunities afforded by this weakness. The miscreant had murdered her character long, long before they assailed her person. The charge against her of extravagance has been already refuted. Her private palace was furnished from the state lumber rooms, and what was purchased, paid for out of her savings. As for her favorites, she never had but two, 
and these were no supernumerary expense or encumbrance to the state. Perhaps it would have been better had she been more thoroughly directed by the Princess de Lamballe. She was perfectly conscious of her good qualities, but de Polignac dazzled and humored her love of amusement and display of splendor. Though this favorite was the image of her royal mistress in her amiable characteristics, the resemblance unfortunately extended to her weaknesses. This was not the case with the Princess de Lamballe. She possessed steadiness, and was governed by the cool foresight of her father-in-law, the Duc de Penthievre, which both the other friends wanted. The unshaken attachment of the Princess de Lamballe to the Queen, notwithstanding the slight at which she at one time had reason to feel piqued, is one of the strongest evidences against the slanderers of Her Majesty. The moral conduct of the Princess has never been called in question. Amid the millions of infamous falsehoods invented to vilify and degrade every other individual connected with the court, no imputation, from the moment of her arrival in France, up to the fatal one of her massacre, ever tarnished her character. To her opinion, then, the most prejudiced might look with confidence. Certainly no one had a greater opportunity of knowing the real character of Marie Antoinette. She was an eyewitness to her conduct during the most brilliant and luxurious portion of her reign, she saw her from the meridian of her magnificence down to her dejection to the depths of unparalleled misery. If the unfortunate queen had ever been guilty of the slightest of those glaring vices of which she was so generally accused, the princess must have been aware of them. And it was not in her nature to have remained the friend and advocate, even unto death, of one capable of depravity. Yet not a breath of discord ever arose between them on that score. Virtue and vice can never harmonize. And even had policy kept her highness from avowing a change of sentiments, it never could have continued her enthusiasm, which was augmented, and not diminished, by the fall of her royal friend. An attachment which holds through every vicissitude must be deeply rooted from conviction of the integrity of its object. The friendship that subsisted between this illustrious pair is an everlasting monument that honors their sex. The queen used to say of her, that she was the only woman she had ever known without gall. Like the blessed land of Ireland, observed Her Majesty, exempt from the reptiles elsewhere so dangerous to mankind, so was she freed by providence from the venom by which the finest form in others is empoisoned. No envy, no ambition, no desire, but to contribute to the welfare and happiness of her fellow creatures, and yet, with all these estimable virtues, these angelic qualities, she is doomed, from her virtuous attachment to our persons. To sink under the weight of that affliction, which, sooner or later, must bury us all in one common ruin, a ruin which is threatening hourly. These presentiments of the awful result of impending storms were mutual. From frequent conversations with the Princess de Lamballe, from the evidence of her letters and her private papers, and from many remarks which have been repeated to me personally by Her Highness, and from persons in her confidence. There is abundant evidence of the foreboding she constantly had of her own and the Queen's untimely end. 47. There was no friend of the Queen to whom the King showed any deference, or rather anything like the deference he paid to the Princess de Lamballe. When the Duchesse de Polignac, the Comtesse Diane de Polignac, the Comte d'Artois, the Duchesse de Guéche, her husband, the present Duc de Gramont, the Prince of Hesse Darmstadt, etc., fled from Paris, he and the Queen, as if they had foreseen the awful catastrophe which was to destroy her so horribly, entreated her to leave the court and take refuge in Italy. So also did her father-in-law, the Duc de Penthievre. But all in vain. She saw her friend deprived of de Polignac, and all those near and dear to her heart, and became deaf to every solicitation. Could such constancy, which looked death in its worst form in the face unshrinking, have existed without great and estimable qualities in its possessor. The brother-in-law of the Princess de Lamballe, the Duc d'Orleans, was her declared enemy merely from her attachment to the Queen. These three great victims have been persecuted to the tomb, which had no sooner closed over the last than the hand of heaven fell upon their destroyer. That Louis XVI was not the friend of this member of his family can excite no surprise, but must rather challenge admiration. He had been seduced by his artful and designing regicide companions to expend millions to undermine the throne, and shake it to pieces under the feet of his relative, his sovereign, the friend of his earliest youth, 
who was aware of the treason. And who held the thunderbolt, but would not crush him. But they had been foiled in their hope of building a throne for him upon the ruin they had made, and placed an age where they flattered him he would find a diadem. The Prince de Conti told me at Barcelona that the Duchesse d'Orleans had assured him that, even had the Duc d'Orleans survived, he never could have attained his object. The immense sums he had lavished upon the hoard of his revolutionary satellites had, previous to his death, thrown him into embarrassment. The avarice of his party increased as his resources diminished. The evil, as evil generally does, would have wrought its own punishment in either way. He must have lived suspected and miserable, had he not died. But his reckless character did not desert him at the scaffold. It is said that before he arrived at the place de grieve he ate a very rich ragout, and drank a bottle of champagne, and left the world as he had gone through it. The supernumerary, the uncalled for martyr, the last of the four devoted royal sufferers, was beheaded the following spring. For this murder there could not have been the shadow of a pretext. The virtues of this victim were sufficient to redeem the name of Elizabeth from the stain with which the two of England and Russia, who had already borne it, had clouded its immortality. Point forty-eight. She had never, in any way, interfered in political events. Malice itself had never whispered a circumstance to her dispraise. After this wanton assassination, it is scarcely to be expected that the innocent and candid looks and streaming azure eyes of that angelic infant, the Dauphin, though raised in humble supplication to his brutal assassins. With an eloquence which would have disarmed the savage tiger, could have won wretches so much more pitiless than the most ferocious beasts of the wilderness, or saved him from their slow but sure poison. Whose breath was worse than the upas tree to all who came within its influence? The Duchesse d'Angoulême, the only survivor of these wretched captives, is a living proof of the baleful influence of that contaminated prison, the infectious tomb of the royal martyrs. That once lovely countenance, which, with the goodness and amiableness of her royal father, whose mildness hung on her lips like the milk and honey of human kindness, blended the dignity, grace, elegance, and innocent vivacity. Which were the acknowledged characteristics of her beautiful mother, lost for some time all traces of its original attractions. The lines of deep-seated sorrow are not easily obliterated. If the Sanguinary Republic had not wished to obtain by exchange the generals Lafayette, Bournonville, Lameth, etc., whom Dumerier had treacherously consigned into the hands of Austria, there is little, doubt but that, from the prison in which she was so long doomed to vegetate only to make life a burthen. She would have been sent to share the fate of her murdered family. How can the Parisians complain that they found Her Royal Highness, on her return to France, by no means what they required in a princess? Can it be wondered at that her marked grief should be visible when amidst the murderers of her family? It should rather be a wonder that she can at all bear the scenes in which she moves, and not abhor the very name of Paris, when every step must remind her of some outrage to herself, or those most dear to her. Or of some beloved relative or friend destroyed. Her return can only be accounted for by the spell of that all-powerful, amor patri, which sometimes prevails over every other influence. Before I dismiss this subject, it may not be uninteresting to my readers to receive some desultory anecdotes that I have heard concerning one or two of the leading monsters, by whom the horrors upon which I have expatiated were occasioned. David, the famous painter, was a member of the Sanguinary Tribunal which condemned the king. On this account he has been banished from France since the Restoration. If any one deserved this severity, it was David. It was at the expense of the court of Louis XVI. That this ungrateful being was sent to Rome, to perfect himself in his sublime art. His studies finished, he was pensioned from the same patrons, and upheld as an artist by the special protection of every member of the royal family. And yet this man, if he may be dignified by the name, had the baseness to say in the hearing of the unfortunate Louis XVI, when on trial, well. When are we to have his head dressed, a la guillotine? At another time, being deputed to visit the temple, as one of the committee of public safety, as he held out his snuff-box before the Princess Elizabeth, she, conceiving he meant to offer it, took a pinch. The monster, observing what she had done, darting a look of contempt at her, instantly threw away the snuff, and dashed the box to pieces on the floor. 
Robespierre had a confidential physician, who attended him almost to the period when he ascended the scaffold, and who was very often obliged, malgré Louis, to dine tête-à-tête -tête with this monopolizer of human flesh and blood. One day he happened to be with him, after a very extraordinary number had been executed, and amongst the rest, some of the physician's most intimate acquaintances. The unwilling guest was naturally very downcast, and ill at ease, and could not dissemble his anguish. He tried to stammer out excuses and get away from the table. Robespierre, perceiving his distress, interrogated him as to the cause. The physician, putting his hand to his head, discovered his reluctance to explain. Robespierre took him by the hand, assured him he had nothing to fear, and added, Come, doctor, you, as a professional man, must be well informed as to the sentiments of the major part of the Parisians respecting me. I entreat you, my dear friend, frankly to avow their opinion. It may perhaps serve me for the future, as a guide for governing them. The physician answered, I can no longer resist the impulse of nature. I know I shall thereby oppose myself to your power, but I must tell you, you are generally abhorred, considered the Attila, the Scylla, of the age, the two-footed plague, that, walks about to fill peaceful abodes with miseries and family mournings. The myriads you are daily sending to the slaughter at the place to grieve, who have, committed no crime, the carts of a certain description, you have ordered daily to bear a stated number to be sacrificed. Directing they should be taken from the prisons, and, if enough are not in the prisons, seized, indiscriminately in the streets, that no place in the deadly vehicle may be left unoccupied, and all this without a trial, without even an accusation. And without any sanction but your own mandate, these things call the public curse upon you, which is not the less bitter for not being audible. Ah, said Robespierre, laughing. This puts me in mind of a story told of the cruelty and tyranny, of Pope Sixtus V, who, having one night, after he had enjoyed himself at a bacchanalian supper, when heated with wine, by way of a bon bouche, ordered the first man that should come through the gate of the Strada del Popolo at Rome to be immediately hanged. Every person at this drunken conclave, nay, all Rome, considered the Pope a tyrant, the most cruel of tyrants, till it was made known and proved, after his death, that the wretch so executed had murdered his father and mother ten years previously. I know whom I send to the place to grieve. All who go there are guilty, though they may not seem so. Go on, what else have you heard? Why, that you have so terrified all descriptions of persons, that they fear even your very breath, and look upon you as worse than the plague. And I should not be surprised, if you persist in this course of conduct, if something serious to yourself should be the consequence, and that ere long. Not the least extraordinary part of the story is that this dialogue between the devil and the doctor took place but a very, few hours previous to Robespierre's being denounced by Tallinn and Carrier to the National Convention. As a conspirator against the Republican cause. In defending himself from being arrested by the guard, he attempted to shoot himself, but the ball missed, broke the monster's jawbone only, and nearly impeded his speaking. Singularly enough, it was this physician who was sent for to assist and dress his wounds. Robespierre replied to the doctor's observations, laughing, and in the following language. Oh, poor devils! They do not know their own interest. But my plan of exterminating the evil will soon teach them. This is the only thing for the good of the nation. For, before you can reform a thousand Frenchmen, you must first lop off half a million of these vagabonds, and, if God spare my life, in a few months there will be so many the less to breed internal commotions. And disturb the general peace of Europe. 49. The same physician observed that from the immense number of executions during the sanguinary reign of that monster, the place de Grieve became so complete a swamp of human blood that it would scarcely hold the scaffolding of the instrument of death, which, in consequence, was obliged to be continually moved from one side of the square to the other. Many of the soldiers and officers, who were obliged to attend these horrible executions, had constantly their half-boots and stockings filled with the blood of the poor sufferers. And as, whenever there was any national festival to be given, it generally followed one of the most sanguinary of these massacres, the public places, the theatres especially, 
all bore the tracks of blood throughout the saloons and lobbies. The infamous carrier, who was the execrable agent of his still more execrable employer, Robespierre, was left afterwards to join Taulin in a conspiracy against him, merely to save himself. But did not long survive his atrocious crimes or his perfidy. It is impossible to calculate the vast number of private assassinations committed in the dead of the night, by order of this cannibal, on persons of every rank and description. My task is now ended. Nothing remains for me but the reflections which these sad and shocking remembrances cannot fail to awaken in all minds, and especially in mine. Is it not astonishing that, in an age so refined, so free from the enormous and flagitious crimes which were the common stains of barbarous centuries, and at an epoch peculiarly enlightened by liberal views, the French nation, by all deemed the most polished since the Christian era, should have given an example of such wanton, brutal, and coarse depravity to the world, under pretenses altogether chimerical, and, after unprecedented bloodshed and horror, ended at the point where it began. The organized system of plunder and anarchy, exercised under different forms more or less sanguinary, produced no permanent result beyond an incontestable proof that the versatility of the French nation, and its puny suppleness of character, Utterly incapacitated for that energetic enterprise without which there can be no hope of permanent emancipation from national slavery. It is my unalterable conviction that the French will never know how to enjoy an independent and free constitution. The tree of liberty unavoidably in all nations has been sprinkled with human blood. But, when bathed by innocent victims, like the foul weed, though it spring up, it rots in its infancy, and becomes loathsome and infectious. Such has been the case in France. And the result justifies the Italian satire. On Alboro sends a fruta. Beretta sends a testa. Governo che non resta. The end.